again, Pat Windrow, sitting at the cable easel with a program which is part two of a painting that I began called Pansies, because this is the season. Behind me is a crystal, a painting of a crystal, a little tiny thing that I own. It's no longer than that, but I thought I'd bring it in because I don't bring in uh, very many of my what you might call slightly abstract works, and I thought maybe you'd like to be able to see that I do uh, get off onto something else uh, once in a while. Besides landscapes, I do get into other other objects, and that's um, that's one of about 25 paintings that I did for a series, uh, for a show that I did called Crystallinity. And it's a very complicated thing, but it's rather, rather interesting to try to understand what you're looking at. Those rainbows inside that crystal are, are actually do happen. Well, here is part two of a pansy study. Uh, there's probably nothing more intriguing than a vase of pansies, either because the life of a pansy is so short or because the colors are absolutely so seductive. Um, I, uh, I, did the, uh, I did the first part of it, this little uh, study on the left uh, in the other program, and this is uh, the final conclusion with the vase. And I've put the shadows in already because, um, well, I was sort of waiting around for things to happen and the vase, uh, I mean, the shadows went in. Here is, um, this, this, this is a, merely a repetition of this one, so it didn't have to go through the yellow one again with you. Here is the, a profile view of this little white and, um, and mauvish one. Uh, these are all high hybrid uh, uh, pansies, as you know, when you introduce hybrids to a species, you get a variety of colors which are not found in um, in uh, the, what you would call the so-called normal f flower. Uh, hybrid pansies are ones that have been crossed with others, and of course they react extremely well to this hybridization, and um, you get a variety which is, uh, when, you're in, when you're in the flower market or in the um, r road stand looking for flowers, you are so, uh, you are so astonished at the different variety of, of, of pansies that is very difficult to choose them. I found myself taking far too long choosing these. But here is a little profile one of a little mauve and uh, and pinkish one that um, that is obviously a hybrid and uh, it's uh, it's got a, a rather wonderful um, series of pinks and deep crimsons and whites of course the center is not visible uh, the little yellow triangle in the middle isn't visible which all pansies have because it's in shadow but that very delicious dark tone uh, in the um, in the lower fall and as I said in the first program there are five petals to just about every pansy uh, unless the uh, unless one has been mutilated but um, five petals is is it um, and uh, it's just a good thing to remember when you're doing p studies of pansies to to remember that somebody is going to uh, somebody is going to recognize the fact that you maybe have missed one so <clears throat> Uh, being picky about the number of petals is, is important. Uh, as I was talking about flower painting before and have been talking about p flower painting for a long time, uh, flower painting is a, is, is a very peculiar, a very particular type of discipline. It means that you have to learn to work extremely quickly and also that you have to be able to uh, uh, um, understand the anatomy of a flower. Uh, and that only comes from observation. It certainly does not come from copying somebody else's painting of flowers. It has to come from your having it right there and understanding what the turn of this petal means and why it's doing it and what happens to it when it does turn. Because if you don't make it turn, then it's, uh, then it's a wallpaper pattern. Uh, and. Um, wallpaper is nothing wrong with it but uh, what you're trying to do is to do an interpretation of a flower as you see it in in its own environment now I've got here some uh, uh, pure purple out of the tube and I'm going to mix it with some uh, white which is of course maybe the right color for this one here which is barely showing you its purpleness uh, if that's a word and if it isn't it becomes a word as soon as I say it so the purpleness of this fellow back here is what I always thought was the color of pansies, purple pansies. Uh, the the uh, the, um, the growers have changed that, and they have introduced all sorts of other wonderful tones to these flowers. And here is one of them, uh, with its um, with a um, with a uh, mauve and very, then very dark, uh, very dark center part uh, in what is uh, in what is uh, probably the most common color of pansies, namely the purple ones. Um, this one back here is extremely dark because it's in shadow, uh, shadow cast by the other one. But um, the just just the mere introduction of that pale purple there. Of course, your monitor is showing it as blue. There's something st weird about the trans transmission of it. But um, here in the studio, that is a definite definitely mauve flower. 
and there it is uh, blue on the monitor. So there's something about my monitor that is making things appear blue when they, in fact they are not. Um, here, uh, let, let me progress as quickly as I possibly can because uh, these, these, um, these uh, programs just escape me uh, before I know it they are gone and um, my my fellow behind the camera is giving me a signal that the time has run out and I have to wind it up so I'm going to I'm going to work as quickly as I can from one to the other and spend uh, as little time as possible on the details I just want to to know how I approach the business of doing these flower paintings they uh, I don't do them very often I seem to have been doing more studies of uh, landscapes because this is local origination and landscapes are okay but there is also the business of attending to the age-old and classic um, business of painting flowers. Uh, it has been um it has been the uh, interest of painters throughout the centuries. Uh, probably the most famous flower paintings have been by famous landscape painters, namely Van Gogh, who painted his sunflowers and nobody uh, I suppose uh, who knows anything at all about uh, painting in general has ever missed the fact that Van Gogh painted those in extraordinary sunflowers and then Manet uh, uh, I mean, Monet uh, did uh, a painting of Iris, which are extremely famous, and they are, um, you can buy reproductions of them in the Metropolitan Museum. They sold for $18 million. Uh, so flower paintings are um, not only sought after, but they have also interested painters for centuries. Uh, the Chinese have been known for uh, thousands of years as being the uh, foremost flower painters uh, of the art world. But then the Dutch came along and have done uh, and did the most um, complex and huge painting uh, paintings of um, flowers of all kinds uh, interspersed with shells and um, porcelain and silver and I'm sure that anybody who has thumbed through any of those books and knows that those that those Dutch uh, flower paintings are, are known throughout the world so flower painting is not just a ladies pastime which was thought many times in the early days in America that uh, ladies ladies would stay home and paint flowers and that they were the best ones at it. Well, actually, the great painters have all been involved with flower painting. Uh, go, everything from the, uh, from the Japanese, Chinese, the Hindus, uh, the French, <coughs> um, the, uh, the Russians, and uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Gauguin, who went to the South Pacific to uh, live in Tahiti for his life, did the, some probably the most beautiful flower paintings that have ever come out of a brush and a human being's uh, craft. <clears throat> so. Uh, naturally, I am interested in uh, flower paintings of all kinds, uh, <clears throat> big ones and little ones and full compositions and so on. So. Uh, here I'm going to get to into this remarkably uh, blood red uh, um, pansy and I'm going to dilute it a little bit with some of my nice painting medium that I've discovered but this blood red pansy is really dramatic and um, it uh, it certainly I put it there because it has such an extraordinary feeling to it that it is in the midst of all this mauve thing here comes this brilliant red uh, object with a uh, very darkened and uh, well it's almost an evil uh, uh, color. It's so dark. <clears throat> And this is another hybrid, of course, probably stemming from purples. And then they introduced uh, they introduced some maybe bluish ones and some lavender ones. And the next thing you know, you've got these amazing, huge, very deep flowers. By all means, if this program inspires you at all, just go out and buy a flat of pansies and put them in, and you will learn something about the distribution of color right in your own uh, right at your doorstep uh, to go out and and see what it is that makes these things so intriguing. The combination of colors, uh, uh, decorators, of course, have been relying on flowers for years to do the decoration that you will find in many, uh, in many terribly high class uh, homes that um, the decorators have simply taken flowers and swiped the colors from them because they work. And uh, when you put deep purple next to brilliant red, uh, you know that that's more than likely been taken from some, uh, some wonderful and common uh, flower, uh, such as the pansy. So, <clears throat> 
And of course, uh, the uh, the center of these uh, with their little, um, well, very concentrated pale, this one's got a very pale whitish green center, which I'm going to mix up and show you how that's going to, how that's going to uh, identify this. This got a little bit of green in there, and then it also has its a little touch here, and then it's got its brilliant yellow, which I pick right up from the, um, <coughs> from the palette with no mixing at all. These are all pure colors. So who can, who can actually resist that, um, that look and there's a shadow underneath here which is going to tell me that that's the end of that particular uh, area well okay so we've gone and <coughs> and uh, my my poor pansy that is lying on the uh, <coughs> on the studio table has now succumbed to the lack of water but i do have the um, the uh, frozen shot which i can work from for the little pansy pansy that is lying on the table <coughs> Uh, in the frozen shot. Here is the now the problem of the vase. The vase, of course, is as, is as, in, is as important to a still life composition as <coughs> uh, the flowers themselves in the, this object in which these uh, <coughs> items are sitting uh, or are, are actually surviving at this point. And this is a vase of, of a sort of a translucent a uh, pale uh, pinkish glass blown vase. It has to be treated so that uh, when you wind up with it, uh, it looks like what it is. If you don't, then you, uh, then you have missed the, um, the uh, observation of what it is that makes glass look the way it does. And what it does is the soft lines that glass, even though the, the, the uh, highlights are extremely sharp, it's the soft blending of the colors which makes glass do what it does. So as you can see here, I'm blending this very, as carefully as I possibly can, and I'm coming down here with a paler tone. I have to keep everything below white because white is going to be the highlight <coughs> of the lights. So. No matter how pale I get, I have to keep it uh, 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 what I call under uh, under white. Uh, it's, uh, it's something to remember for all painting of porcelain and glass or anything that's shiny, that when the highlight is brilliant, it has to be the most uh, what you call the hottest uh, tone uh, of the of all of all the colors and the hottest being the one that picks up the most light not necessarily red or or orange or yellow so here is the basic <coughs> tone of uh, of this vase which is uh, which is uh, milky milky in sh in uh, in feeling and um, <clears throat> while I'm just sort of laying this little background color in I'll take a very short break and I will not be too gone too long so come back and uh, give me just one moment to clean my brushes episode of this uh, this um study of pansies um 
I'm working on the vase. Uh, obviously, the flowers had to be done very, very quickly because, well, one has already died. But um, the vase is, is, is important, and, uh, and I think that selecting a vase is great fun, and also to be able to, to make it look glassy is another one of the challenges. Here is a shadow being cast by the, um, I'm, I'm working on this, on, the, on this vase now, the shadow being cast by the pansies uh, is vital. It tells you what the shape of the vase is, and it has to be, uh, it has to be somewhat the same tone except just slightly darker and it has to conform and there it is right in front of you giving you all the information that you ever need for your uh, for your work is right there in front of you um, you don't have to guess at any of it a lot of people are very concerned about working from life because they find it is much more difficult well actually it's much more simple because your all, all your information is just given to you right there and all you have to do all you have to do that's not quite fair is to interpret it this shadow of this pansy uh, starts dark and then it blends itself over towards the edge probably from reflected light but this is a this is an important um, uh, phase of it too because it, um, it, it it is the mystery of what it is that happens when you are working with rounded shapes and shadows so uh, the, uh, the, there is an area that is uh, sort of dark down below here, uh, which has to be attended to, and uh, it's it's slightly darker than the uh, than the uh, lit side of the vase. And my medium that I'm using is being very cooperative, and it is making things blend very nicely. So don't forget that if you think that I have tricks uh, that are that are um, that I'm perpetrating on you here, I do. It is called archival painting medium, and it is available. It's three dollars. I just saw the price here. It's three dollars and eighty three cents which is going to last you for at least a year that's not too bad and um, it is it, it enables you to blend it also enables you to have something dry quickly and as you can see blending is essential in all all my realistic and lifelike paintings, you must use the ability to blend. Well, here is now going to introduce the swirls. I'm going to show you the swirls of this rather beautifully designed little uh, handmade uh, glass vase that found its way into the studios in Hopog, Long Island from a gray and dismal uh, week in Belgium, uh, in Europe. Uh, isn't it, uh, it always intrigues me as to how things find their way to where they happen to be at the moment. And this little one, uh, well, it was bought for a nominal sum, and it also found its way into this studio. And uh, eventually, I suppose it, it has found its way into your into your knowledge of its existence, which I think is also even more intriguing. So um, there you have the uh, m my strange kind of philosophy about objects and things and how you can actually give them a, a sort of an interesting little lifespan all on your own. These swirls uh, are probably what made me interested in it because uh, I don't know how they do it. I cannot imagine how a glassmaker gets these little swirls in there, but he did. and. Um, uh, they, uh, they are helping a great deal for the interest of this painting. Uh, I'm sure that the people who watch here have got favorite objects, and um, because objects tend to be uh, ephemeral and to disappear, uh, either through breakage or theft or loss or whatever, to paint them and have them, uh, have them immortalized, as it were, is a sort of a nice idea. I have done that many, many times. And if I lose the, my little crazy crystal that I have, I'm going to have this great big portrait of it that is behind me here and that I talked about before. So here are the swirls. I'm going to blend this a little bit with my finger. It's a little bit too dark and it needs to have some softening. And the finger uh, works very nicely. However, always be sure that you do not eat or drink anything when you're working because if you do smear something with your finger uh, you take a chance of well getting it into your food here is the uh, here's the highlight which I was here are the highlights which I was talking about on this vase which we believe is white and uh, which now is going to become glassy and shiny uh, hopefully uh, there are many lights in the studio therefore there are multiple highlights involved they are extremely sharp because the glass is very, very clear, I mean very smooth, and the highlights that are picked up are extremely, are extremely sharp. Uh, there is a little bit of a, of a light tone here in this part of the vase too, and probably down here, you can, I can probably uh, have a little bit of a blend of some pale color down here as well. Um, uh, oils are the only things that are going to allow you to do this. You cannot really ever do this kind of thing with watercolors. It's oils that, that does it. Uh, let me see if I can blend. I'm going to take a dry brush and show you. I don't do this very often, but take a dry brush how I can do what a painter's call scumble. You scumble this whole, uh, this whole look here by making it extremely soft. 
if you are if you are a stickler for authenticity and for the rendering of this of this vase, that's how I um, you would you would render it very very soft. So I suppose that that shines rather nicely. The base is a problem uh, because it's uh, it's it's sort of amorphous. You don't really understand what's happening in that base. It just has a lot of dark colors and it also has a lot of highlights. So I'm going to interpret it. There isn't that much time to spend on it. When I will refine this in my studio, I would be able to spend some time on it. But let's see if I can just sort of, uh, well, the word is fake it as I go, as I'm going through here. Let me see, there is a, there is a swirly, there are swirly designs on these feet. And then there are little little highlights that are sort of unexplainable, but nevertheless there. And uh, oh, two at once, that was good. And here are all these little dotted dotted ones back here because of the texture on the foot of this of this little vase. And it's uh, well, you know, it, um, it it does not have to be important, but it must be there. It must be shown and interpreted somehow. And the fact that um, well that, that we're running out of time also helps me to uh, be able to get off this subject. Now, the uh, the whole thing is is pretty much done as it were. There is no reason to really assume that anything more has to be done, but compositionally, this little pansy lying on the table here uh, kind of brings the whole thing together. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to work from the monitor. The little pansy uh, in the studio here uh, has not been able to survive the uh, hours that it's been lying without water. Therefore, it is now no longer a pansy. It's now a faded blossom. So that was too harsh. Let me get that out of there. Good. Let's see. Um, Okay, now um, the, the reason for the little pansy on the table is, as I say, for um, uh, molding it all together. The fact that it has died and I have to work from a monitor bothers me, because I usually don't work from the monitor on these still lives. But I'm going to do. I'm going to interpret it as best I can. Uh, this this one this uh, flower down here is uh, just a well. It's my own personal selection of how to uh, work with this composition and make it interesting. So. Uh, um, it does not have to be in here, but I think that the um, composition is helped by its presence. Um, once again, the business of flowers uh, is um, is a not only a challenge, but is also an extremely enduring type of painting. The um, the people who have been uh, painting flowers uh, do it from life. They do not copy other people's flowers. If you uh, if you do, you risk the chance of somebody who has done a bad painting of beautiful flowers. And um, there is no reason to assume that uh, everybody who has the ability to imitate form and to transfer form to the uh, to the second dimension, which is all this is doing. This is transferring an observed form uh, into the second dimension from the third dimension, which is all painting from life really is. Um, you are you are taking um, you are ab being able to translate um, the dimensions. Something which may, maybe um, is, uh, well, it's, uh, see that poor dead thing? Now you've seen that. That's what happens, and it's a matter of a half an hour. So uh, laying the, the pansy on the table, I probably should have waited until the end of the program and then just, uh, and then just done it uh, then, just laid it on the table and worked from it then. However, uh, it's, getting, it's, it's getting a second life in this painting. And uh, what, how does that go? You see how hard this is to tell unless it's actually there. There's the little fold in the bottom one, and here is a little. Here are some little um, folds in this one, and what happens to the other one? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, the uh, the need to uh, t the need to observe is what I'm um, continually and maybe tirelessly talking about in this program of mine, whereby you um, y you observe, and if you don't observe, then you have missed uh, first of all half the experience, and secondly, you've missed the understanding of the subject that you're working on. Observe it, and then you will understand it. So. With the final, with the final push, uh, and there is a, um, th there is a, a, a real <laughs> uh, occupational hazard here in this studio. A, uh, a young man with earphones on and everything leans out from behind the camera and puts up two fingers, and that means uh, you've got two minutes. Uh, which, of course, at that point, anybody with any sense would panic. I try to remain calm at all times. However, it looks like the time is here because um, he's going to now say 
one minute or two minutes and then he's going to run his finger across his throat and that means that you're going to get cut off and that uh, death has arrived for this particular program. Uh, you may as well know all these things that I have to endure here while I'm trying to be an artist and um, but it's all part of the game and I think that uh, if you don't know all these things that are happening maybe you you have been left out of the game. Now you're into the game. Uh, the signal for bringing this uh, painting to a close is almost here. Uh, I hope that you were able to uh, kind of understand what it is that I do about painting flowers. Uh, they are essential in the world of learning how to paint. And um, if, you, uh, if you do one, I can almost guarantee that you will be hooked and you will do more than one. You will do two and ten and hundreds, such as I have done, if you are, in fact, serious about becoming a painter. Be sure uh, that if you uh, start painting, that you can, in fact, devote enough time to it. And um, it, will, it will pay off in uh, remarkable experiences of learning what it is that you, what you can do and all also learning about these, this place that we live in, this extraordinary planet in which variety is sometimes taken very much for granted. Well, I have a few little details. I've forgotten one of the little, the little yellow, the little yellow center of this one up here, which means that you always go back over. It's like looking, make, making sure that you've turned all the lights out before you go on vacation. I'm going to close up this, this palette, and this painting is going to be finished once and for all. But in the mean, but before I do that, I have to make sure that I've gotten the details. And here is a little detail of this one. These little triangle up here. This fellow has missed its yellow center. And in it goes. Here's this little yellow center on this one. Uh, little tri little, a little uh, semi-moon-shaped uh, thing up there with a sort of a dark middle to it. Uh, there we are. And what else? Oh, I've missed the curve on that one up there. I could probably stick that in with the last few seconds that are remaining. It's, um, it's, uh, it, uh, let's see if this, can, if this uh, can tell a good story. This little, this little petal here turns and it, and it folds over and casts its own shadow. Well, this is one of the things that makes me a uh, flower painter. I love to see those little turns. And then there's a brilliant quality down here that I'm going to blend with my finger. Fortunately, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't have any sandwiches around or anything to, to eat. I never, never eat when you're painting flowers or anything for that matter because you run the risk of getting uh, of getting these poisonous paints into your system well this is it now, he did it he uh, gave me the signal that time has run out so uh, appreciate your watching I thought hope you liked it this is what he does wind it up so I'm winding it up goodbye everybody thanks for for your interest and uh, be sure that whenever the cable easel is advertised to tune in I'm liable to be able to show you something bye-bye <laughs>